Hello guys, this is Abhishek Vanjani. Welcome to another session of Tech Talk. So this Tech Talk is all about open source contribution and Google Summer of Code. So today I have a very special friend of mine named Manish Devgan. So if I talk about his achievements, I can make an entire video completely focusing on his achievements. So he has achieved a lot in the field of open source contribution and GSOC. So if I talk about Manish Devgan in brief, so he currently holds a full-time offer with Sprinkler, Urban Company and Adyen. Along with this, he has served as a software engineering intern with Springer and software developer for Fossetia as a part of GSOC. So he has won number of hackathons and have contributed towards Mozilla, Chatterbot and HubSpot. Basically, he is an excellent developer and an open source contributor. So I don't have much experience about the open source contributions and about GSOC. So I thought of having a tech talk with him in order to guide you all. So if you are aspiring to participate in Google Summer of Code or focusing to build some code projects or learning about open source development, then this video is for you. We are going to welcome him and ask him some questions about Google Summer of Code, his interview experiences, projects, and how to begin with open source contribution. So before we begin with the video, I request you to subscribe to my channel in order to stay updated with all the tech related content and in order to get updates for more such tech talks. So let's welcome Manish Devkan and ask him some questions regarding open source contribution and GSOC. So hello Manish, welcome to my YouTube channel. How are you? Hi Abhishek, I'm fine. So how are you? Bas badiya, yaar. So let's begin with some questions and about your GSOC and open source contribution. So my first question is, I wanted to know something about Google Summer of Code. So what is it basically and how did you apply for Google Summer of Code? Why it is important and what are the different things which one must, must keep in mind while participating in GSOC? So like, these are like a lot of questions. So uh, the first thing that I'll do is just break it down. So the first question is, ki, what exactly is GSOC? So GSOC is uh, just a program which is run by Google. So it is an open source program, which Google has been running for like quite a lot of years now. It has been done so as uh, that people could, you know, start their journey into open source. It is a way of motivating them into uh, getting you know, development into the open source community or even getting used to it. So this is a program which is run by Google. So for people who don't know, this isn't an internship in Google. So you do not actually work with Google during Google Summer of Code. So how exactly Google Summer of Code works is that uh, Google launches some guidelines and there are various different organizations. So these organizations, they apply at Google. So organizations such as uh, Fossa Asia, there, and then there is uh, Mozilla, you've got HubSpot. I don't know if HubSpot is there, but there are like a lot of organizations. They apply and they have various different projects uh, that they want people to come and contribute to. So once Google uh, approves them as an organization, they can then start recruiting people like me who basically want to be student developers uh, during the entire period of like four to five months, depending on your organization or uh, the time frame of what Google has set up for you. So you then start working on that, pro on that project which you have been selected for. So essentially what happens is you end up working with an organization which is affiliated to Google Summer of Code. Right, so there are various different organizations in which you can apply to. So every organization has various different projects that they want people to come up and you know uh, make something out of it, or they want to continue their development into that project. So this is what Google Summer of Code is all about. So it and, is we uh, who select the project, or uh, the project is assigned to us. See, uh, it is basically up to you. So you do not end up applying to all of these organizations. As far as I know, the limitation to apply the number of organizations in one year is I guess you can submit three proposals or it was three uh, at least the time I did it. So uh, you have to be very selective about the projects that you want to go and apply to. So okay. I, I would usually recommend to uh, you know look for projects that really interest you or something that you have been using for quite a long or you have an urge to you know literally help people develop that particular project. So you have to be selective. You have to be working with that organization in order to make sure that you get through those project proposals and all. And then making a proposal in itself is a very detailed thing that people should do. Okay, so we select a project that interests us or we want to work and we give a pro proposal and based on that proposal, we are selected or the result is yeah. after that. You may or may not be selected. Yeah. yeah. So my next question is, are we assigned any mentors or we have to do the project on our own? So are we working in a team like virtually we are working in a team or we are just working alone on that? 
So uh, let's say you do apply for a project and your proposal does get accepted. So then you actually have to work in a you know close environment. Uh, although you do work virtually, but you have to be closely connected with the mentor or the mentors that you have for that particular project. So there are uh, people who might have been working on that project for the last eight years, seven years, five years, something, or they could be your uh, you know past Google Summer of Code students who have then decided to be a mentor for this thing. So you actually end up working with quite a lot of mentors. Sometimes they are not even from the field of development. Uh, they could also be looking at the business prospect of that particular project, depending upon the organization. And it depends on uh, the project, whether it does require uh, more than one student. And this is something in the dis on the registration of uh, the organization that you are applying to. Normally, you only see like around one or two people working on a single project, but it may increase uh, depending on what uh, the organization so do we get a stipend for working or is it just an experience? See, uh, Google Summer of Code is a mix of everything. So you do definitely get a stipend for working with that organization. So the stipend is actually split up into three different parts. Uh, at least it was the same. it was in three different uh, parts when I did it. So I do not know what the current stipend value is because I have not you know, seen what the guidelines are for this year or something. But uh, there are three set of evaluations. So you normally have your first set of evaluation. Uh, if you pass that evaluation, then you are only supposed to, you know, continue working on that project. Uh, you actually have to pass all those evaluations in order to get the stipend. So once you pass your first evaluation, you are given, uh, if I remember correctly, like 40% uh, of the total stipend. And then you have the second evaluation wherein you get the 40% and the remaining 20 is what you get uh, when you pass your last evaluation. But in order to get that certificate of uh, you know completion, you do have to pass all those three evaluations so that you can uh, uh, call yourself as a successful Google Summer of Code. Okay, cool. So my next question is: Does Google Summer of Code actually benefits when we are talking about internships and placements? So, were the projects that you did in GSOC were beneficial while you are applying for internships or in resume shortlisting or in interviews? Any benefit in terms of getting a job? See, I would say that uh, Google Summer of Code, uh, I mean, there is not a clear cut answer to this uh, from my perspective because I want to say that it played like a very huge part in landing me my job or landing me the internship that I had. Uh, but I would say that yes, it does prepare you for what they could potentially ask uh, questions that are related to design or questions that are related to the functionalities of a particular application that they make hypothetically. You are more easily able to actually understand that because you have worked in an environment wherein you have been given opportunity to actually make stuff like that but in terms of resume shortlisting i do not think that it matters as much as people think it to be it is more about uh, you know how good you are academically so you need to have a perfect balance of having uh, good academics uh, it doesn't have to be like really good you do not have to be a nine pointer everything but you could have like decent academics and if you have to put some rough code on your resume it does uh, play a little bit of role to that on the other hand, uh, when it comes to the interviews, uh, Google Summer of Code, I would say, is not that important because uh, there are multiple different kinds of jobs that you could land as a computer science student. If you're actually looking for a job that is particularly into the field or a language that you have worked on during Google Summer of Code, then yes, it will play a major part because you do have a project to support your experience. But if you are uh, you know, going to join in as a software engineer, uh, the core that the company really wants to know is whether do you have enough knowledge uh, to you know, have good knowledge or good uh, control over data searches and algorithms? So you need to find a perfect balance of all these things. GSOC does uh, you know, make your resume a little bit brighter, but at the same time, when it comes to the interviews, uh, the companies are really looking forward to people who can solve those algorithmic problems and you know, be good at data structures. So I would say yes, but no as well. So yeah, as you said that it was a little bit beneficial for you when you were interviewing and I saw your resume and it was full of projects and your contributions in the open source. So what I wanted to ask was, was it beneficial when you were actually interning with Spinter? Like you were already equipped with some beneficial skills that you have learned during your GSOC. So was that beneficial when you were interning with Spinter or was it easier for you to, to learn new things? So uh, my Google Summer of Code tech stack was completely different from what I had in Sprinkler. So they were working on a Java backend, which was something I had never done. 
So I wouldn't say that it was easier for me because there were people who had, you know, who had experience in Java already. But at the same time, I would say that uh, having been both uh, in an organization that was so big, I, I was a Google Scholar course student with Fossation. So I was used to those uh, big bunch of codes. So I would say that it was relatively easier for me to understand the workflow and to understand those semantics which were being used uh, when they were actually deploying or you know developing the production ready code. So yes, it did help me in understanding the code better. Uh, but perhaps the knowledge that I needed for a completely new stack was something that I had to gain. And uh, I would say that GSOC was a bit beneficial since I had to be you know acquiring a lot of knowledge working on different frameworks. And there were various different challenges we had to encounter every day. So there were new things to learn almost every day, and there was a harsh deadline for us to Google Summer of Code. So yes, it did help me during my uh, Sprinkler internship because I was able to quickly grasp what all was going on, and at the same time, was able to you know understand uh, the course and the logic. Uh, maybe because I had experience uh, doing it before during Google Summer of Code. Yeah, so as you mentioned about the large chunks of code and you were easily able to like understand that. So if I talk about my experience at Amazon, so the first task that was assigned to me, it was a huge piece of code and I was like scared seeing this much code for the first time. And it took me like half of my internship to complete my first task. So like obviously that was, I think was beneficial for you to work in an organization or having an experience of GSOC when you were dealing with that size of code. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So as a beginner, if someone wants to enter the development field or someone wants to develop some good projects or learn about web development <laughs> or machine learning or app development. So what do you suggest? Like what should we actually try as a beginner, as a first year student, whether we should go for web development or app development or machine learning? Or like I have seen many people are basically crazy about machine learning these days. Well, yes, there are a lot of buzzwords which are currently, uh, you know, into this area or into this particular field. Uh, but if you would ask me how to start, I would uh, literally, you know, want people to be uh, able to start using those products or those projects before they even think about contributing to them. Because one of the aspects of open source, not Google Summer of Code, because Google Summer of Code is derived from open source. So open source is the bigger deal in this particular part. So one of the things about open source is, is some, something that people do not understand is that even if you are using those products, you're actually contributing to it. How? You're actually contributing to the ecosystem that actually runs or is created around that particular project. You are helping them assess all of those vulnerabilities or all those problems that you may encounter while using that product. So strictly dry, diving into development, is not something I really encourage. I would want people, you know, start using open source projects, start using open source products, and then see what are the things that they really want to change in that product, right? If you are a beginner, I would definitely encourage you to start using, let's say, a completely different browser, which is open source, and then you may come up with a completely new issue or a problem which you find out in that particular, you know, project or a piece of code, and maybe even report it to them get it solved or even if uh, or if you are you know too courageous then look at the tech stack start and figuring out what the things are and you know uh, muster up the courage and submit a pull request if it comes to the point that i have to tell you which uh, path you should take whether you should go in for web development whether you should go in for game development or app development but it's completely your choice whichever one you want to go for uh, but it normally comes in when you start using those projects. If you start using, let's say, Linux for the very first time and you find that, okay, this is very nice. So you might just want to shift your web development project or web development ideology to the core kernel development. So uh, having a fixed path or a fixed career path or a fixed path in an open source or in development in general is something that I do not encourage because this isn't you know, a competition that you can get into by uh, really following a single path. And there are various different kinds of development that you can uh, do, which you are more comfortable in. So uh, yes, if you are a complete beginner, I would uh, highly advise you to look onto those code bases uh, of the projects that you really find interesting. Uh, it really doesn't have to be, you know, an easy categorization of things. You could definitely be looking onto large, you know, maybe physics or nuclear physics projects from CERN or something. And maybe you could even try contributing to them. So there isn't a fixed path that you should, you know, go from low level difficulty to high level difficulty. It's up to you. You have to actually get 
uh, very into that particular project that you really want to work with. So this is how anyone who really wants to come into the open source uh, community should start. So they should first start by actually using those products, uh, see how they work, or even find out a flaw. I mean, it could it could literally be a small spelling mistake into their project code base, and you can submit a pull request. It really helps a lot with the project because there are a lot of developers who are looking on the core core part of the problem, but there are a lot of leftovers that you can you know just pick up hit bits and just solve it for them, and then potentially get into that project and make some very very big contributions. This is how I started, and this is how I really want people to start because it really gives them a sense of confidence into themselves, and they can actually you know change their field or change their line whenever they want to, depending on the project that interests them. You may be interested in a machine learning project right now, but at the same time, within two months or let's say two days, you might want to shift to some very big project that is completely you know, command line system or something else. So you need to be a little bit flexible. So there isn't a concrete or a direct path. To it. So before talking to you, I used to think that we should like master some tech stack or like learn something before we actually go for open source contribution. I used to think that uh, like I won't be able to like do any open source contribution without knowing about the tech stack. So that's why I like was a little scared with open source when I was a beginner and I am currently also a beginner. I don't have any much experience in open source contribution, but yeah, this was my point of view before talking to you. But now, yes, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I mean, you do not necessarily have to be a software developer in order to contribute to open source. You can literally do it in various different forms. If you do not wish to write code, you can just encourage people uh, near you to start using those projects or products or softwares which are made open source. This is a huge deal for people who are actually making them, right? Because you do not get paid for doing open source products. So what all you are looking forward is to the teach of the product. If you can, you can definitely solve English issues. English issues. You can look for localizations, and let's say you want to, you know, C plus plus because that's all you do in university or college. But you can still contribute a lot. There are a lot, a lot of projects. You do not necessarily have to be a very good web developer in order to be a good open source contributor. So yeah, I have a personal question for you. So what are your career plans ahead? So are you going to be a software developer if you think about it? in future so are you going to serve as a software developer in future or do you have some other plans uh yes i mean uh, software engineering is one field that i would uh, you know be going into and this is one of the paths that i've followed right now uh, at the same time i would you know also be willing to uh, working with different open source groups uh, there are various organizations uh, i'm not actually looking in for you know fixed type and stuff i do it because i like it there are a lot of projects that i contribute to on daily basis and there are a lot of projects that I haven't contributed for a long time. So I would really like to, you know, continue my streak of working with them. Uh, this is one of those acts where you can say selfless act because I won't be getting any uh, monetary benefits. But since I like to do it, I would want to continue doing it. And uh, one of the things that I would want to do is, you know, raise awareness about open source in general so that people could come to know about what are all the benefits and they could also start using. But yeah, software engineering is one of the fields that I would want, definitely want to pursue it. So the final question that I have is any tips for the young aspiring open source contributors, like some resources that they can refer or anything like that. Okay. So, uh, for resources, I believe for any open source contributor, GitHub is one of the largest, uh, piece of resource that you can have for yourself. There are a lot of beautifully written codes from various different projects that you might be using like every day, but have no idea that they are open source. Uh, the single piece of advice that I give to people is to be curious. You do not have to be afraid of what the project is. You don't have to be afraid of how big that entire code base is. If you are curious enough, you can actually find that small bit of bug, which can help you land a single pull request and that great sense of accomplishment that you really need in order to, you know, be better at open source development. It's just that it's a really big piece of code, but it is also because it started with a single line. Right, but it was way back. You just should not be afraid of looking into all those codes because there are a lot of brilliant pieces of code which are available on the internet. But I would say GitHub, since it's all free for you to see. And I would say just go on, uh, brainstorm yourself and see what bugs can you potentially find. So how to like begin with seeing a code? Like if I see uh, 2000 lines of code, I am like, pretty scared of like looking into it and seeing about it. 
like i am a c++ developer and i saw a code of 2000 lines and it is completely based on like web development and i have no idea about it so how to go about that how so to face that? going about the code uh, you know um, you should if you are actually digging into web code you should start from what i like to call as a layering perspective so when i say that you should start using the project it's because then you actually identify where the problem lies so if you're using let's say my project that has tens of thousands of lines of code so you're using it and you find that okay there is a flaw in this functionality right so now you layer down that functionality okay so it is happening on this page this is the section that i'm having a problem with this is what i given as an input where the problem actually lies and this are all and these are all the steps which actually happen so now with that entire huge chunk of code you need to be finding it using these layers right if you see that the problem that you are facing on my end is when you try to open let's say a video file so you know that you have to be looking into the files which actually just deal with the functionality of opening that file right or browsing that particular category and then you see that you are having a problem let's say opening mp4 files or mkv files so you need to find those keywords and then see how that flow works so you do not necessarily have to be working with all those tens of thousands of lines of code because you are narrowing it down on every bit i mean it's easier for you to understand if i would say that you are you know pioneer researching it because every layer that you take off you are actually reducing the entire code by two because there is a lot of functionality that you don't need to care about at that particular point of time so once you take away one layer you are reducing the code by half the other layer the other layer the other layer there are a lot of times when you will get mixed up but that is how you actually start learning i mean it isn't always that i find it in the very first try it takes me sometimes like weeks or maybe even days or something but yes this is how i do it and this is how i expect people to be doing it because it helps you get started to an entirely new piece of code which you have never seen anywhere so this is how i do it and this is how i pay people to do it as well. so one thing that you said previously that you do it because you love it so Um, I see most of the people. Uh, if I talk about competitive programming as well, so people are like, "Will this benefit if I am looking for an internship or a placement?" So people are usually focused on getting an internship and a placement. So can you just tell about how fun it is actually to do open source contribution and how achieving it feels when you make a pull request and how you actually feel? being a open source contributor like you are not doing it for money you are not doing it for stipend you are not doing it for internships and placements so can you like tell about your experience and about how you feel as a open source contributor yes yeah, surely i mean i have uh, quite an instance which have happened like a lot of times uh, it's when you actually start making those small small contributions and the very first thank you that you start receiving on this protocols is what actually motivates me it really makes me feel a part of uh, that entire project um, there are people who have you know like 125 commits into that project and i am there just uh, you know making a small change within their names where it was just a single typo but that single piece of thank you really makes you feel that you have the same level of contributions as they have so the entire community that revolves around open source project is really nice they are really humble and they are always up you know to help you out and uh, i actually have made like a lot of developer friends uh, just because of being able to contribute to these projects and they are not from the place that i live they are from different parts of the world they are 20 years uh, you know older than me they are 5 years younger than me they are my same age they are people who are you know phd graduates they are a lot of people so one of the things is they know me they actually know me and they value the work that i do and there are times when they have referred to the single piece of pull request that i made onto platforms where i didn't expect it to be so yes that recognition on a scale where you see yourself as a contributor of a project that people are using it really makes you feel uh, special about it. right if you start contributing start contributing into firefox and then you see like almost every other laptop using firefox you do feel that you have done something in your life so that you are making a change because any piece of code that you write now could potentially be you know creating a problem for all of them or be solving a big problem for them this is a very very big community you do get to attend a lot of events if you are good at it so there are conferences where you can go and uh, meet those people in real life uh, with whom you have worked with so i have contributed to uh, jinjawa it's a project by hubspot it's a big company 
and the project is way too big. It's in Java. Uh, the person who merges my pull request has like, he has more experience in Java than my age right now, right? So if I'm not wrong, but see, he knows me on a one-to-one -one basis. He knows who I am. I know who he is. We are on good terms. We contribute to the same project. They value my work. I value their work. At the same time, uh, they also encourage me to participate and I really want others to participate as well. It's a mutual feeling when you see your project being so good that people are actually willing to use it. You do not, I mean, it's a compromise. You do not necessarily always want monetary benefits out of things. Some things you do just because you feel like you want to do it. And this is something you can only get in once you start doing it. This isn't something that I can you know, express it into words for you. This is when you start seeing your changes being reflected into their products and thousands of people who are using that product. So yeah, okay. So that was really great. The things you said was like really great. So I think that's all for this video. So if you have any questions regarding any of the things from Manish or me, you can just leave a comment in the comment section and we will certainly try to take out some time and answer your questions. So I think that's all for this video. Do like, share and subscribe and do let me know if you have any doubts. Yes. Okay. Bye Please bye keep Manish. asking questions. Bye bye. Have fun. Bye Manish.